On the night of June 20th, 1965, four friends set out on a once-in-a-lifetime adventure to a deep thermal abyss about 90 miles northwest of Las Vegas, Nevada. The friends, who desired to rise above their hopelessly mundane lives, donned their makeshift scuba gear and descended into the shadowy depths. Unfortunately, their dream journey turned into a nightmare as tragedy ensued deep down in the desolate cave. Jim Houts was born in rural Colorado during a blinding snowstorm, but his family moved to California when he was four years old. As a child, he spent much of his time between the family home in the San Bernardino Mountains and Catalina Island, where his mother ran a summer Girl Scout camp. As a diehard nature lover from an early age, Jim was particularly enchanted by the deepest, most remote, and least explored parts of the world's oceans. In fact, he always knew he was destined to be a diver, and he turned his dream into a reality by enlisting in the U.S. Navy and volunteering for the submarine service. After a rigorous training program in which many of his counterparts dropped out, he joined an elite underwater recovery and demolition team that morphed into what we now know as the Navy SEALs. During his long, illustrious career, Jim traveled the world, dove into unbelievably dangerous conditions, and helped recover test missiles from early ballistic missile submarines. Jim eventually had his fill of military life and retired in the mid-60s, but he wasn't about to hang up his gear and spend his golden years of diving just playing shuffleboard. Instead, he set out to challenge himself by exploring the most dangerous, uncharted, underwater cave systems that he could find. By some accounts, he was only one of a handful of divers capable of undertaking such an ambitious endeavor and making it out of the world's most dangerous caves alive. By then, Jim had known about Devil's Hole for years, but it became a far bigger priority for him after he left the Navy. He heard rumors that it plunged down to more than 400 feet into the earth, but he always suspected it was far deeper and more complex than anyone had ever even imagined. A number of expeditions had set out to map Devil's Hole to its depths. All had failed and a number of experienced divers had barely escaped with their lives. To Jim, it all added up to one big challenge that he just couldn't pass up. Devil's Hole is a unique geologic formation located in the remote corner of Death Valley National Park in Nevada. For centuries, the mysterious pool confounded those who stumbled upon it, largely because it seemed so out of place in one of the driest places in North America. It probably formed about 500,000 years ago after an earthquake in the Amargosa Desert created a fault that eventually filled with rain and spring water. It may be the deepest underwater cave in the United States, and it's continually growing and changing due to seismic and tectonic activity nearby, as well as in faraway places like Mexico, Chile, and Japan. In one instance in the spring of 2012, researchers working on site were surprised by a mysterious four-foot wave that rolled through the submerged cavern. This is a big earthquake, or it's really close. I'm just happy I'm not standing on this platform anymore. Look at that, they're underwater. <laughs> they were equally surprised to learn that it had been caused by a 7.4 magnitude earthquake in Oaxaca, Mexico, approximately 2,000 miles away. This and other similar events seem to show that Devil's Hole is connected to a previously unknown network of water-filled caves, caverns, and channels that stretch across the world's continents and oceans. Devil's Hole is only recognizable by a small warm water pool shimmering in a small fissure in the jagged rock. But below the surface, it drops down 30 feet to a limestone shelf and from there, an immense chamber that Jim Houts famously dubbed the Infinity Room because it seemed to have no bottom. A number of passageways radiate from the main room and lead to chambers of differing sizes at various depths. Many of these chambers contain air pockets that can be death traps for inexperienced divers. Though the air inside may look safe to breathe, it's actually saturated with carbon monoxide and other toxic gases. The Timbisha Shoshone Native Americans of Death Valley knew about Devil's Hole 
long before it was discovered by settlers of European descent. But they forbade their children from visiting the alluring oasis for fear that they'd be kidnapped and devoured by nefarious beings known as water babies. According to tribal elders, they also believed that the underground waterway acted as a highway on which benevolent shaman could travel vast distances without ever having to come to the hot, dry surface. These Native American beliefs partly inspired California cult leader Charles Manson's fascination with Devil's Hole. He apparently thought it was a portal to the afterlife and that it would be a perfect place to ride out the impending apocalypse with his followers in relative safety. Native American legends and doomsday predictions aside, Devil's Hole is home to one of the world's most endangered species of fish. The one-inch Devil's Fish Hole pupfish is only found in Devil's Hole and only in the upper 50 feet of the pool. Nobody's sure how long the fish have been there or how they got there in the first place, but they've adapted to living in the warm, oxygen-depleted water. Pupfish spot on the rock ledge just a few feet above the surface. And though it varies from year to year, the population is sometimes just a dozen of fish. During the 60s, Devil's Hole wasn't so well known, and it was generally off-limits to all but the most experienced divers like Jim Houts, who dove there multiple times. But it became more of a household name when portions of Jim's dive reports were featured in newspapers and television broadcasts across the country. At the same time, the plight of the pupfish became a rallying cry for environmentalists and animal rights activists from coast to coast. What had once been little more than a local curiosity was now big news. Because, in many ways, there's something magical about knowing that there are still places that are truly wild, dangerous, and untouched. Such places have always existed in space, in the deepest parts of oceans, and the most remote African and South American jungles. To know there's a mysteriously otherworldly and largely unexplored natural wonder just a few hours' drive from the glitz and glamour of the Las Vegas Strip is even more beguiling. Devil's Hole first popped on to Paul Jocantieri's radar when he read a newspaper article about one of Jim Houts's excursions into the Infinity Room. At the time, Paul was a 19-year-old cafeteria worker at the Nevada test site, and he wasn't particularly thrilled with the prospect of spending the rest of his life working in a hot kitchen for low wages in close proximity to nuclear fallout. What he longed for was an adventure that would allow him to escape from his soul-crushing existence. Not far away in Las Vegas, 20-year-old David Rose worked at an equally dead-end job as a parking lot attendant at a casino. The two had become brothers-in-law a few months before when David married Paul's sister Paula. When Paul showed David the article about Devil's Hole, they both knew that they finally found what they had been looking for. The way they saw it, they'd become overnight sensations when the word got out that they successfully explored Devil's Hole and lived to tell about it. The unique opportunity couldn't have come at a better time because their families had been pressuring them to make significant changes in their lives. Now, with a sense of direction for the first time in what seemed like ages, they convinced brothers Bill and Jack Alter to join them. After modest preparation, the four young men set out for Devil's Hole on the evening of June 20th, 1965. Upon arriving, they climbed the craggy hillside, leading to the entrance which was blocked by the imposing fence, peppered with signs that said, Do not enter. The men knew that they were trespassing and probably breaking a number of state and federal laws, but they hopped the fence anyway and continued on toward the rim of the 8 by 60 foot pool, approximately 50 feet below where they were on a hill. As they got their bearings, the beams from their flashlights illuminated the outlines of the shiny blue-gray pupfish swimming below. But despite the splendor of the moment, Jack Alter, the youngest of the four, was having second thoughts. Many young men would have given in to peer pressure and kept their mouths shut, but Jack told his friends that he definitely was not going to go in the water. However, he did agree to stay on top and act as a lookout in case anybody came looking for them or there was some sort of issue and he needed to go get help. After donning their flippers, masks, snorkels, and air tanks, Paul, David, and Bill shared an uneasy glance at each other before slipping into the warm, black water. 
Then, after taking a moment to get acclimated to the odd environment, they took stock of what was around them. One thing they noticed right away was the light from their flashlights disappeared into the blackness before revealing what was below. It was as if they were suspended over a chasm of endless proportions. Even so, they were determined to make the most of the experience. They wanted to explore this place and they needed to make something happen. They weren't going to leave until they got what they came for, which was an adventure. In a short time, they descended down to a hundred feet. It was not easy for them to maintain orientation in the darkness. They spent time searching different parts of the cavern, not really paying attention to how much time they had spent down there. Also, maintaining orientation in the darkness was really hard. They didn't really know which way they were going, if they were going up or down or wherever. They had no dive line to guide them back out. And Bill noticed that his oxygen supply was running dangerously low because he in particular had been breathing more heavily than normal. Due to the fear and adrenaline that he was feeling down there, this place terrified him. Assuming that his friends must have been in similar situations, he motioned to them with his flashlight and the three began heading back to the surface. But they drifted apart during the ascent. Bill and David surfaced sometime after midnight and waited for Paul to join them but he never did, and this was a huge problem. They quickly dove back down to see if they could find him, but he seemed to have just disappeared. From the minimal amount of research they conducted, they knew about air pockets, and there was hope that Paul found an air pocket. But they didn't do much research past that, and they really weren't sure if those air pockets had toxic gas in them. They ultimately went down nearly 200 feet, at which point, David also disappeared into the vast expanse of liquid darkness. Now, out of air and gripped with panic, Bill surfaced alone. And when Paul and David failed to reappear, he and Jack had little choice but to drive all the way back to Las Vegas to get help. Word of the mishap at Devil's Hole spread quickly, but the first search and rescue personnel didn't arrive on site until early the following morning. Meanwhile, the families of the missing men were notified as well. They held out hope that they'd be rescued and that everybody would have a good cry and a few hearty laughs when the ordeal was finally over. But behind the scenes, law enforcement officials and first responders knew that the chances of finding the boys alive were slim at best. Hopefully they made it into one of the air pockets or found their way out of the cave, but it was going to be a challenge to find them, and that's if they were still alive. Diving legend Jim Houts got the call to come to the boys' rescue. As the crisis in Nevada unfolded, he was hundreds of miles away giving a diving presentation at the Newport Harbor Yacht Club in Southern California. During his talk, Jim was interrupted and discreetly informed that a representative from the federal government was on the phone and that there was a matter of grave importance that required his specialized skills and immediate attention. After apologizing to his curious audience, Jim learned of the circumstances surrounding the disappearance of the two men at Devil's Hole. But what the caller really wanted to know was if they might still be alive bidding their time in an air-filled chamber just below the surface. Jim said that the men could still be alive, and after making a few phone calls, he was able to get together a team of four expert divers who were willing to help and risk their lives in this rescue attempt. One was a Vegas nightclub singer named Harry Wom, who'd accompanied Mel Fisher on one of his famed treasure dives in the Cortez Bank back in 1957. Things were falling into place as well as they could be expected under the circumstances. And by the time the government had arranged for the men to be flown from Los Alamitos to a tiny airstrip in Ash Meadows, just a stone's throw away from Devil's Hole. After a short flight, the plane circled over the target area while the pilot assessed the situation below. He tried to get the plane down onto a short runway several times, but its location behind a mountain made the approach impossible for such a large aircraft. Eventually, the pilot changed course and headed for Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. From there, Jim and his crew were driven to Devil's Hole a few hours away. Ironically, they were amongst the last of the rescuers to arrive. In fact, the media, the police, the military, and the men's distraught families had already been there for hours, waiting for the expert divers to show up. 
Jim and his colleagues had logged hundreds of hours of diving in caves similar to Devil's Hole, but they never worked in such a tense, crowded, and emotionally charged environment before. Though they were confident in their skills and experience, they also knew that things could go south in a second, and they were putting their own lives at risk. This wasn't something to take lightly. Jim split his team up into two groups, and they would go down at different intervals. Disoriented and possibly even lost, he knew that nitrogen narcosis, or nitrogen poisoning, was a real risk. Because nitrogen poisoning includes symptoms similar to being drunk, it can even cause the most experienced divers to act erratically and make stupid decisions that could kill them. By teaming up, the men would be able to minimize risk and keep an eye on one another. Now, as anxious onlookers peered down from the craggy outcroppings above, Jim and his team began descending into the infinity room. Shortly into the dive, Jim found a mask, a snorkel, and a flashlight on a ledge just 100 feet down. A noticeable hush fell over the crowd when he broke the surface with the gear, but it didn't necessarily mean that one or both of the men were dead. In fact, these items could have been left intentionally to lead rescuers to their location. If so, they could still be alive in an air-filled chamber not far away. But if this was the case, they were running out of time. Meanwhile, the men's friends and family tried to maintain composure. But Paula John Kintieri, Paul's sister, and David Rose's new wife broke down in tears. Jim and the team made a number of additional dives down to 320 feet, but they never saw the men. And the search and rescue mission was eventually called off. Even now, no one knows exactly what happened to Paul John Kintieri and David Rose, or how deep the infinity room at Devil's Hole actually goes. Security at Devil's Hole has increased significantly since Paul and David disappeared, not only to prevent amateur divers and careless thrill-seekers from suffering similar fates, but to protect the pupfish. During one of his many dives at Devil's Hole, Jim Houts and a partner dropped a weighted line from the surface down past the 900-foot mark and never made contact with the bottom. That's all I have for you today, and I appreciate you watching until the end. If you found this story both fascinating and heartbreaking, be sure to show some love to the like button and subscribe to the channel for more stories like this one. I hope to see you at the next one.